Thanks, everybody. I'm going to talk about just business, and I'm going to ask, it's an ask at the end of this for some help from you folks. It's boring stuff. Um, it is quality assurance on data sets that Randy kind of spoke to a little bit. Think of it like you never think of the rebar on the foundation on your house, how your brake pads are attached to the rotors on your wheels. We don't think of these things, right? We just accept them. And the problem is, if those things don't work right, bad things happen. The data that we collect in this basin is the foundation for so many analysis, and we need high quality data. And just to think about the cost, I know many people in here participated in that KHSA interim measure 15. At 500,000 bucks a year for 15 years, plus everybody else's time, Randy's time with seed and the the folks at Reclamation who participated without cost, the, the dollars inside Pacificor they spent. This is a seven or eight million dollar investment. And we want it to be the best that it can be. If you got, went to Davis, somebody did here, there's a professor there, they call him the butterfly professor. His name's Art Shapiro. And he says the best thing you can do, the best contribution a scientist can make is leave behind a long data set. We got a 15 year data set here. And my ask of you is how can we hold this together and do the best job we can? I can't do it by myself and none of us can. So let's go through this. Um, yeah, yeah, so I've done that. Go on. We're gonna talk a little bit about water quality data just so we can talk about the same topic, the terminology and definitions. There are multiple terminologies. We're just gonna stick with these simple ones here so we can get through this. Um, some data issues that came up uh, with the Karuk tribe looking at some previous data. And then how do we how do we go forward? So we've talked about a lot of samples. Grab this is going out, filling a bottle, um, processing these at laboratories. Um, there's, there's physical, chemical, biological um, grab samples. We also have data songs that Randy talked about remote loggers, there's also remote sensing, this aerial imagery we now have for uh, uh, cyanobacteria blooms, all kinds of things. There's all these various elements. That's a picture right there of two things happening at once, a data sound and a grab sample being processed from a churn splitter at state line. So um, when we get into this, we have all these methods too, and don't worry about it. There's standard methods, there's EPA methods, there's USGS, there's others. What's really important was you build your programs, just write it down, just so we can come behind or you can share your information so we understand what it really is. And then there's these two things we're gonna talk about, MDL and RL. And you know, this courier font is the worst. It's like, a, it's like an old typewriter, you know? It takes me back to my like third grade report card. Excuse me. <laughs> and yes, we had report cards when I was in third grade. Now everybody gets like, A's, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, we have these constituents in this table, alkalinity, and notice there are three labs here. They're very small, sorry about that. There is EDGE, it's a lab in Corvallis. There is IEN in Seattle, and there is SRWQL, which is the Klamath Tribes lab up in Chiliquin. And there's all these different constituents on here, alkalinity, ammonia, dissolved, organic carbon. They're not all here, but some. You'll see the methods are listed, a little abbreviation. And then you'll see this MDL and RL. MDL, method detection limit. That means I can find it, okay? Does not mean I can reproduce it every time. And what is science based on? Reproducibility. So we have reporting limits, which are higher typically than the method detection limit. And the laboratory will say, I'm confident I can reproduce that number for you. Does that mean exactly? No but it means I can reproduce it within a range. If we all, if we all took data songs out and measured temperature, they would not all read 11.18. They'd be a range, but we, we could agree that we could report temperature between 11.1 and 11.2. We might be able to agree on that. And that's good enough for the science we're doing here. You'll notice the labs have different method detection limits, different reporting limits. They're not all the same. It's a function of the laboratory. It's a function of the equipment. It's a function of the staff and their training. So it's not fixed everywhere you go and it can change mid-year. All of this is in the KHSA IM15 annual reports. You can go back through all of them. 
You can find all these reporting limits and method detection limits when things change in the middle of the season and other problems that occur. We tried to catch all that stuff. So again, MDL, I can find it, I can detect it, but I'm not sure I can reproduce it. RL reliably quantified with some acceptable level of accuracy and precision. Again, these are all things, not static. It's not a fixed multiple of MDL also. So if I have a method detection limit of 0.01 and a reporting limit lab of 0.03, that's a three times multiplier. That's not always the case for that constituent or that laboratory. Basic stuff, this is not rocket science. If you really wanted to, and I get the vibe right now that you don't really wanna get into this, okay? You can do all this. It's, if you can balance your checkbook, I also realize nowadays that why most people don't balance their checkbook anymore the way I do, because I'm old, right? But you can do this. So here we are, what, what, what are these categories? What happens when I have a constituent that is below the method detection limit, between the method detection limit and the reporting limit, or greater than the reporting limit? How does that data come about, right? So this first condition is, it is less than the method detection limit, right? Not detect. Okay, ND, you often see that in the data. Okay, it also could be reported as just less than the reporting limit. The next one is the second one, it's in between the two. A lot of times you see this as sensor data, that less than, so it might come in as less than the reporting limit. It might also have a little, a little parentheses with lowercase j in it, called j data. I have no idea what that means. I, I know what it means, I don't know where it came from. So what that means is sometimes as an analyst, and I know that Jake and Eli in particular are interested, you've detected it. It's not at the reporting level, but I, can you send, share that data with me? And the lab will share that with you. They'll just put a little J by it, which means it could be anywhere in there. So it's in there somewhere. And then the third one is, it's above my reporting limit. I'm just gonna put that number right in my report. I'm good to go. Not, not bad, right? So let's look at ammonia here as just an example. Two different labs. This is the one in Seattle. This is the Chiliquin lab. And you can see that they have different method detection limits and reporting limits. And my ammonia concentration is the same in both of these. All right. How is it reported here? The MDL is 0.005. That's, that is to the left of the concentration or lower than. So is the reporting limit. So that just is a value. The concentration is 0.02 milligrams per liter. I'm good. Down here, it's sitting in between, okay? Because a different lab, different equipment, different trained people, that's what they can do. It's all right. I'm not saying anybody is better than any, or worse than anybody else. No judgment, right? But it's in between. So we just might report that as CNH is less than 0.03, sensor data. You could also ask the lab, and they might give you the J data that tells you what it is in between there. They might not, they might not be able to come. So what happened here? Oh, one more thing, relative percent difference. We talked about that, that data sum we took out and that there's a little range that we're comfortable working in. So what we have with relative percent difference is lots of times there is a blank. So I'm gonna go collect samples and we have a duplicate in there. So out of 10% of my samples, I should have one duplicate. I mean, uh, for ten, one, one duplicate is 10% of my sample set. And same with a blank. A duplicate is that, that, that picture with the saw in the background, somebody had a white canister. That's a churn splitter. And that's so you can fill it up and you can split samples. So that I mean, this and this are drawn from the same bottle of water. I'm gonna take a regular sample and I'm gonna take a duplicate. I'm gonna give them to the lab and see how good they do, right? How close are they? I'm also gonna fill one with deionized water and that's gonna be my blank. I'm looking for contamination. If I really wanna test the lab, I'll spike one. Not like a drink in a bar, okay? I'll put something in it known and I'll send that to the lab and see if they can reproduce it. Duplicates, 10% of my samples. Blanks, 25% uh, of my samples. Spikes, 10% of my samples. So you have these samples mixed in, you hide them, you put, fake numbers on them and fake times on them. So the lab doesn't know, although they know, because I'm telling you, when you sample the Klamath River below Iron Gate and you send a blank in and it's crystal clear and the others are full of stuff, easy to see. Okay, 
what, what are, but what does this mean? So a RPD with a duplicate and a, and a regular sample, two samples from the same volume, the lab is not going to say, I can reproduce this exactly. Most labs ask for a buffer, a 25% range. So when I have a sample that has 0.5 milligrams per liter of something in it, that's plus or minus 25%. You should have a new appreciation right now. It should just shock you. I don't see the shock, but that these data are not exact. They have quite a bit of variability in them. And that's because these are imperfect processes in the laboratories. So here we have one. This is a lab that gives us, most of our labs right now, we have talked into giving us a plus or minus 20% relative percent difference. So the values here, I can go 80% of that, 120% of that. When I have samples that look like this, where I have 0.14 and 0.2, right? You can look at the plus or minus on each of those. Those overlap, statistically speaking, same. You can't really differentiate there because that value can be anywhere on that line. That's what the lab is saying. That's where they're comfortable reproducing it. So we do our science. We have to accept there's this much variability in the data. Okay. Now we got all that straight. We can talk about what happened. Any questions really quick? Okay. So uh, Brook Tribe contacted us earlier this year. This is pre-KHSA data, but some of this is snuck into the uh, KHSA data too. Two things happened. PO4, uh, Randy was just talking about this, values are greater than total phosphorus. And like Randy said, total phosphorus is PO4. This, this is the soluble reactive phosphorus. This is what a plant can uptake. It's the inorganic form. Is In the total phosphorus, it's that plus organic phosphorus equals total. How then, how then can this be greater than that? Right? It's just, you can't have more orthophosphorus than you have total phosphorus. And the other one that's really weird is negative values in the data set. Negative concentration? Mm. All right. How do you handle these? And how do we manage this master data set that we have and that we're going to extend into the future so we can keep track of all this so we're all using the same data? So that Eli isn't sitting at his computer fixing a data gap. Josh is sitting at his computer fixing the data gap in a different way. Lyra is fixing her data gap in a different way, and suddenly we have 35 different data sets. That we, don't want, we don't want to do that with our $7.5 million data set. So here's the PO4 values. When you look over here on the right, just to cut to the chase, all the colored ones had the problem where orthophosphate, the dissolved inorganic form, was greater than the total. When we apply the criteria, though, okay, plus or minus 20% relative percent difference, all the green ones, I mean, all the blue ones uh, are fine. They are statistically similar. The reason total phosphorus is less than PO4 is because there's lab uncertainty. There's just plus or minus 20%, and one can be 0.1, and one can be 0.09. That's close enough. In fact, when I get a data set from a new lab, the first thing I look at is TP and PO4. I look at the whole thing, and if I don't find a single point where my PO4 was not just a little higher than my TP, I call the lab. I say, how come you've given me a plus or minus 20% difference, yet I never ever see that occur where PO4 is just a tiny bit higher, right? And that's the guy who usually says, because I review the data very carefully, and if we have that, I go back and test and rerun the samples to make sure it was right. Still shouldn't come out that way. It gives me the willies, but I go on with it. All right. But there were some, these green ones, that did not make it. They just did clear it. Sometimes, I mean, you got 0 0.13 and 0 0.1, 0 0.13 and 0 0.07 up there in the 2008. It's just imperfect. Sometimes they miss, right? We can go back and look at those lab reports and check it out. This is the nature of water quality data. If you're rolling up your sleeves and getting into this, you're going to find these kinds of things. And just, again, just write it down, all right? I don't believe the 0.07. I don't believe the 0.13. I did this. I did that. So that when we meet as a group, when we present our information and our findings, we can have a discussion on what it really means, what your analysis conclusions were. If it makes you uncomfortable, we can have recommendations to collect more data. 
The next one is negative ammonia. Oops, sorry. This is a weird one, okay? You can look over here on the right-hand column. There's a bunch of negative numbers, okay? What happened? Remember how I said you can ask for the data between the reporting limit and the method detection limit, and when the lab gives it to you, it comes with a little J? This particular person, I will not name names, asked for all of the data from the lab, all of it, all the way down, whatever that distribution, when that person running that machine pushed the button, whatever came out of it, he asked for it because he wanted to make box plots and he wanted to use the entire data set. But a negative concentration is just not allowed. It should just be an ND. So these data here, we would probably go back, look at the reporting limit and just censor it right there. Anything less than 0.1 gets a less than 0.1 and move on. That's what I would do. Eli might do it different. Laurel might do it different. This other Eli might do it different. People I don't know whose names might do it different. So these are the questions that are arising. And we want, I talked to the steering committee, and they let me stand up here and talk. Uh, we would like to get some feedback on how we, how we handle this. How do we take a data set and make sure that when we correct it, it's one data set. Is it in Seeden, right? That's one of our biggest issues. Is it sitting in spreadsheets on Pacific Core's website? How are we gonna manage this? There will be errors. It can be a transcription error. It can be just a mistake. It can be a lab number we don't like. It's going to happen. We're gonna to continue to find them, but how do we protect our investment and as we add to this, with all the data sets, I mean, I was sitting back there thinking about all these people presenting data. I'm like, where is that data? Where is it sitting? And, and are we talking about, how do, we, how do we remedy those mistakes, errors, omissions? And there's no malice here. This is just business as usual. It happens. And how do we, how do we get past that? So my first, you know, these are all questions, is go back and look at a couple of these KHSA reports. Look at the section that says problems this year, remedies, right? There's all that stuff is written in there. Do we have a protocol or can we develop one that says, um, I don't know who you are, but you found a data problem and you report it to cable. And you say, Randy, I got this problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what do we do with the mechanisms to address it? And how do we fold Seedon into this? Seedon is a beast of a thing, man. It's hard to deal with and correcting it is even harder, right? Try talking to a teenager, Seedon just puts that shame. Okay, I've got a lot of teenagers. Um, communication, do we meet annually? Do we post it if it's really important? Who's the point of contact, Randy? Um, what is our role? Is there, are there other things? So this is my ask of you. We don't have to answer this right now. And maybe we can meet, meet back to the steering committee and develop a little list and, and submit it to the membership. Maybe some proposals. I'm just making this up on the fly now. So you can give us your feedback, your experiences, so we can take this data set, continue to move it forward. This is gonna be bomber, 15 years of a program that was designed. I mean, I know, you know Eli and Jake and others here were in these meetings, and Laurel I think was probably in some of them. We are developing a program to assess the system for ecological function, physical, chemical, biological conditions prior to dam removal, that will assist in post-dam removal, restoration actions, trend analysis, all this. How do we protect that and move that forward? That, that is my ask of you today. Um, usually you come to these things and you just take it all in. Well, you got to give some back. All right. And that's all I have to say. So any discussion? Thank you. Questions for Mike? Um, so this was all like water quality, nutrient, physical chemical data that's like graph text. What about continuous data? Auction, for example, where you go out one week, everything's great, two weeks later, and there's an algal mat just stuck on your sensor, and then you've got to go back into the post-processing and figure out how to decipher the different trends that you see in there. Um, I found a protocol that NOAA uses for like their ocean-based DO sensors mm -hmm. and collecting real-time data and, and trying to build an automated system around that. But that's just my personal data that 
address these problems differently. And I think that's going to be a significant problem considering how many SONs are out there just collecting data across the basin and across the state and the country and the world. So the world. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ocean base. So um, what's really great is we have bomber partners. You know, we have the Yurok tribe, the Karuk tribe, Pacifico was involved in their portion, reclamation uh, sampled free of charge. Um, KBUMP put together uniform protocols. Uh, we have water quality meetings that go through the basic structure, answer questions. There's an annual report. Uh, we ask for all the data. Watercourse does put the annual report together. Jennifer in my office goes through all of the DO data, all the temperature data, and says, hey, you know, your DO data here in the Klamath, <laughs> this happens, looks very much like you've switched with pH, you know, 7.5, 8.2, that can happen. Mm -hmm. Cleaning this up, I've got a data set, I have a, I have a song that went south, what do I do? And they're doing that within that KHSA, so KHSA program, which is no longer funded, right? So we have those questions to ask too, but that, could be a model. I'm not saying it is, but it could be a model, a place that we can start from. Um, again, if you do it differently, that's absolutely fine. Just write down what you did. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, ideas? Um, Mike, I, I know, you know, it's kind of a boring topic, but it's so critical. And so I, thanks for giving that presentation. Um, and, you know, it just highlights you know, this is the work that's not fun, um, but it's so important in order to have these quality data sets. So, you know, make sure your program, if you're collecting this type of data, is budgeting the time to, to do this review, to look at that information as it comes back from the lab. So if there is a question, you, you know, if something doesn't look right on the lab report, get in touch with them right, you know, right away so you can get that, correct, get it reanalyzed. Um, but also from a data management perspective in the long term, getting this data finalized and into your own databases, make sure you're not making typing errors, you know, which we shouldn't have to do that, you know, much typing anymore of, of entering data. Um, but just throughout the whole data life cycle, we've got to try to, you know, make sure we don't make mistakes or um, or have, you know, information in there that's, that's not correct. So it's a big challenge. Um, it takes a lot of time. And it is just critical in order to have the, that good data set at the end, because if we do all this and we make a mistake and that data gets into, you know, a, a public database like Seeden or WQX at the federal level, like Mike said, it's really challenging and expensive to then get that data corrected. So uh, you don't know who's used it in the meantime. So, you know, this is uh, not the sexy part of water quality and science, but it is just critical. So if you guys have questions about uh, about processes for you know quality control or anything, just you know reach out to us. We can talk you through it, um, go through whatever protocols you have, um, try to develop a good standard uh, approach for you to manage the data. And uh, we thank you for trying to manage that data properly. Yeah, thanks everybody, really appreciate your help. All right, thanks Mike.